name is Nargis Farzad, and I'm a staff member of the School of Languages, Cultures and Linguistics at SOAS University of London. As an Iranian and a Persian speaker, I'm already programmed to love poetry and to find solace in poetry. In these unpredictable days of self-isolation, I keep making lots of uh, just different lists of my favorite poems and poets, both English and Persian, modern and classical. And Molana Jalaluddin Balkhi Rumi turns up on every list. So I wanted to talk about Rumi and his poetry to someone who really knows a lot about Molana. I've invited my friend, a colleague, a leading authority on the life and poetry of Rumi, and last but not least, an alumnus of SOAS, Professor Alan Williams. Alan, welcome to the online SOAS under lockdown. Can I start by asking Alan, where have you been since graduating from SOAS? Since graduating from SOAS? Yes. I've started off getting the first job I could, which in those days I was able to without a doctorate because I left SOAS before I finished my doctorate. After three years, I needed a job. I was getting married. And uh, I went down to Sussex and for six years I taught as a lecturer in the School of African and Asian Studies there. Um, uh, but uh, I also taught part time at SOAS in that period while I was still finishing my doctorate. You could do that in those days. I mean, I know you have GTAs now, but um, I got my full time job um, and tenure in 1979, mm -hmm. which I only retired from last September after 40 years before I got my doctorate. Okay. So, I mean, that's how much the world has changed. Um, but your, this academic path um, started before SOAS at an, another institution, am I right? Well, actually, to be honest, it, my, if you're talking about my interest in Rumi, it started before I even left school. Oh, wow. Because when I was at school, I was a classicist, mm -hmm. and I was a reader, I was a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> and I, um, I, I started, I came across um, the Sufis. It was those days when there were probably three or four books in the shops about Sufism. Now there are hundreds, of course. Of course. Uh, but in those days, there were, there were just a few. And one of them I was fortunate to pick up was Nicholson's translations of the Divan of Shams. Mm -hmm. um, his his translations uh, of the um, uh, they're mostly they're, they're mostly uh, from the Divani Shams, but some of them are also from the Masnavi. And the interesting thing and the tantalizing thing for me was that they were parallel. It was a parallel text, mm -hmm. so it had the, the Persian text on the left and the English text on the right, which is the wrong way around actually. But there it was. And it fascinated me. I couldn't read the script, but I was still at school and I was I started to read Nicholson's Masnavi. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't go and read Persian at Oxford. Uh, I went up to read classics at Queen's College, the mm -hmm. Queen's College. Mm -hmm. But I was there at a difficult time. I, 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 um, I mean, not for classics. Classics was chugging along and I got bored with it. I, I, I'd been doing classics all my school days and I wanted to change to Persian and Arabic mm -hmm. because I had been reading the Masnavi and in short, I wanted to read it in the original. And that's, so Molana is the reason I changed yeah. to Persian. I was persuaded by a very good friend of mine to go ahead and do it. Mm -hmm. um, and she reminds me to this day that it was she that's responsible for my career. Um, but uh, yes, it was a difficult time at Oxford for Persian because you know George Morrison yes. 
yeah. you know, much missed, uh, but even then he was very poorly. Mm. Um, he was elderly um, before his time, really, because he wasn't that old even yeah. when I knew him. But this was in 73. Um, and he was in his anecdotage, mm. right. any way to put it. Brilliant teacher. Obviously, he had been a brilliant teacher and his translations are wonderful of Gurgani and so on. Um, but uh, the, the, the other Persianists there were not interested in poetry so much. I mean, there were options in modern Persian that I wasn't so interested in. Um, but uh, it, it was a, a difficult time, except I had the great fortune to be taught by some really wonderful Arabists, mm -hmm. Albert Hurani. Yes, oh uh, wow, gosh. Yeah. That's and, uh, and then Shafi Kadkani. Amazing. Uh, who is one of the greatest poets from Iran, still alive. Thank and you God. keep in touch with him, don't and you? And I keep in touch. In yeah. fact, I translated yeah. with, with an artist, uh, we translated some of his poetry. Oh, and, um, it's a nice book published by Sohan. Yes. Um, but I met him after 40 years. I met him again um, in Leiden, actually, yeah. recently. Um, mm -hmm. And it was a wonderful reunion. Yeah. But yeah, my interest in Persian goes a long way back. Well, um, but the, the weird thing is that I went to Iran for the first, would you believe it, and the only time, and I'm professor of Persian <laughs> of many years now, uh, I have only been to Iran once in my life, physically. Um, and that was in 1975. Mm. I think you were still in Iran. Yes, yes, just, yes. And, uh, right. just, um, and I was a callow youth. Um, and I was there for months, but I came back. I went there to visit the principally, I mean, I went all around Iran, but except to the far, the far east, I didn't go to, to, the, to, to um, Mashhad, but uh -huh. I, I wanted to go to the Zoroastrian villages near Yazd. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I made it my business, a very long journey south, and I was there for um, a couple of weeks, mm -hmm. and so this was in the August, the worst time of the year to visit um, Yazd. I mean, it's extremely the... hot. God, yeah. that's so uh, awful. I remember yeah. it. I came back in September '75 mm -hmm. after having been in these villages, um, and discovered that there was a series of lectures going on at SOAS called at 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 Oxford at the Oriental Institute, yes. called the Rutten by Cartrack Lectures. And the lecturer was Professor Mary Boyce of SOAS. And I listened to these lectures with my mouth sort of aghast. I was aghast because I was listening to her talking about those villages I had just come from 10 years previously in the, in the mid 60s when she had spent a year in Sharifabad. Wow. Wow. And I heard her talking with great feeling and in great detail about those days. Mm -hmm. And after the lectures finished, I went up to her and introduced myself and said, can I come and see you in London? Because I would be interested in, in doing a PhD with you. Mm -hmm. And she said, oh, so we made an appointment and I went to visit her. It was my birthday. I remember it was in March, mm -hmm. 1976, just before my finals. Mm -hmm. And I then went to SOAS and did three three years at SOAS, learning all the languages I had never thought about before. That is Pahlavi, Manichaean, Sogdian, Avestan, Old Persian, all at one go. We, we more or less started these languages all at one go. And the idea was that you couldn't really do much on Zoroastrianism until you were at least familiar with Pers uh, Pahlavi, Middle Persian, a Western and Old Persian. Yeah. So that was a very steep learning curve. Yes. Um, yeah. And it was an interesting time to be at SOAS. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. I mean, I'm delighted to say that you're a regular visitor to SOAS as a guest lecturer, as an examiner, as a visiting examiner. You've examined many PhDs since then at SOAS. And this extraordinary uh circle seems to have come this journey seems to have come full circle despite your extraordinary career as a professor of comparative literature professor of comparative religions it's back to rumi 
Yeah, it's very uh, strange. I mean, it took me by surprise. To some extent, I didn't know where my career was going. I had published my PhD, which was on a Pahlavi text. Okay. It was a very large two-volume edition and translation and commentary on a Pahlavi text. And it kind of, I won't say it finished me off for Pahlavi, because I was still interested in the more metaphysical texts of, of in Middle Persian, the Dane card in particular, and, and other, um, can I call, yeah, more scholastic, mystical, not mystical, but metaphysical texts yeah. and philosophical texts. But um, I had really come to the end of my interest in Iranian studies, way old Iranian, and was interested in going back to the poetry because as you know middle persian is unfortunately rather devoid of poetry yes. anymore much of it was translated and rendered into uh, the most famous example being the shahname being rendered from the khadai nomag into the shahname um, but i was hungry for poetry which i was missing terribly and uh, by great fortune i was invited by penguin to do a one volume of translation of the mass nevi which i had always been interested in rather more than most people are interested in rumi through his ghazals yeah. Yeah. everybody admits to loving the ghazals and finding the mass nevi hard going yeah and for you know for for iranians i think it's different because they're brought up on the stories yeah. but reading the masnavi in english is a labor of love because it had only been translated into rather archaic english by nicholson yes uh, yeah. nicholson who i have a picture of here <laughs> oh wonderful just to show you Yes, oh, fantastic, uh, gosh, extraordinary. A famous wow. picture of him sitting in Trinity. Oh, very nice, very nice. Well, just, just for the road, this yes. was my supervisor, and Mary Boyce. Of course, very much an absolute legend, one of our yes, most legend. illustrious. And she, was, uh, she was a brilliant teacher, mm -hmm. but like a Zen master. I mean, she <laughs> <laughs> a very unassuming uh, presence um, in the sense that she had to teach from a horizontal position because of her spinal problems, spinal yes. injuries. Yes. Um, but um, yeah, Nicholson's translations, to go back to him, mm -hmm. were almost, well, they made, made reading the Masnavi very yeah. difficult. So when Penguin asked me to do a translation of them, I, I said to them, well, I'm not going to do an anthology. That's been done. Mm. And I'm not interested in filleting it to produce little gobbets of, you know, they wanted an anthology. Yeah. And I said, no, I want to do a whole book because I had a sense that there was something uh, I wanted to discover about the Masnavi. And I think I did find it. And, yeah. and that is that by translating the, the whole book, I began to get a sense of the way that Rumi's mind works. Yeah. And it's the most remarkable mind. You know, I've been going back and reading and rereading just those first 18 lines of the opening of the Nainome, the song of the reed flute and it's um, it's really quite apposite in these days of uh, compulsory or voluntary self-isolation the idea of uh, and i want you to before giving me a translation of that for our audience who may not know what masnavi is tell us a little bit about Rumi's Masnavi, what is it, and what is it um, uh, composed of? Well, Rumi's Masnavi is about that big. <laughs> okay, yeah, on a bookshelf, it is six volumes mm -hmm. of very. I mean, the Masnavi form. Uh, the most famous is the the perhaps the Mandapoter, the Conference of the Birds, and typically a Masnavi would be um, a couple of thousand, three thousand baits. 3,000 verses. Mm -hmm. In other words, and then we find that each of Rumi's six books are longer than those standard Masnavis. So his to the Masnavi is an of epic proportions. It is 25 and a half thousand couplets, 
the equivalent of over you know 50 50 uh, 50,000 verses of English poetry. Just one verse in my new volume, my new edition, one, one, one book, one volume yeah. is that I thick. Um, that's because actually, I mean, I've, I've included the Persian text in this volume, but nevertheless, um, it is an, extreme, an extremely large and comprehensive volume. Now, what is it? Um, the, the, the title tells you nothing, it just means couplets. Masnavi is from the Arabic word ithna, meaning two. Couplet means a couplet form, the, 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 the double bait, the two hemistics of, of, a, of, a, of a verse. Mm -hmm. And um, it is a, a didactic text. Mm -hmm. And that means that unlike the ghazals, which are like hymns or psalms, they're celebrations of a particular idea. Um, of a, one seed is allowed to flower within a few lines, you find that um, a ghazal um, moves through variations on a theme, but it's basically got a, a certain unity to it. Whereas the Masnavi is this great, uh, I wouldn't say lumbering, but this great uh, uh, um, monster of a, of, of a, a vehicle that um, moves forward at by modern standards, quite a slow pace. Um, so it uh, it contains hundreds of tales, but it is not a storybook, and that's the odd thing. It's a paradox that it it it, it seems that Rumi hit upon this formula to tell the story of the reed, to tell the story of humanity, um, and in doing so, to lead the imagination where he wanted it to be, which was in the palm of his hand, mm -hmm. uh, so that he could guide the adept um, up the spiritual path, the, the Sufi path. I don't even like to call the Masnavi a Sufi text, because mm -hmm. it is fi fundamentally a poetry, and that's why I've retained the poetry of the form I've translated it into. Yeah, I've translated it into blank verse. Fantastic. And, um... I, you and I agree that our um, Molana, Molavi for the Persian speakers and the man you've devoted so much of your academic career to promoting is different to the Rumi of uh, Madonna or breathless renditions of uh, Demi Moore or all the other American celebrities. Who is Rumi? Put him in a context for me, please. Well, uh, some, that's a difficult question to answer. Uh, I, don't, I don't know who Rumi is. Mm -hmm. um, I am very familiar with what Rumi says, mm -hmm. and I believe I've become familiar with what Rumi loves um, because his text is all I have of him, mm -hmm. uh, although I hear his voice when I read him. Where where did he come from and you know how did, was, was he just an always a born poet and um you know i yeah. call him balchi and the yeah. westerners yeah. call him rumi yeah what was his give us a little bit of information about his biographical information i suppose is what i'm asking for he was born in in the province of balch or ancient bactria mm -hmm. um he uh, there's a, there is dispute among scholars about exactly which modern country he was born in, but we're talking about the, um, an area far to the east, the east of Afghanistan, present-day Afghanistan, mm -hmm. which are mo modern nation states, Afghanistan, mm -hmm. um, Tajikistan, and um, uh, and uh, uh, Uzbekistan. Mm -hmm. So that that area, uh, several thousand miles to the east of where he ended up mm. in Konya. He lived most of his adult life, all of his adult life in Konya, which is in central Anatolia. Of course, and why travel so far away from his birthplace? Like many, like many, uh, um, he had, to, his family had to migrate westwards. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, it's, it's pretty sh certain that he had to, his father, Bahauddin Valad, uh, moved the family westwards, not simply because of the uh, approaching Mongol invasion, mm -hmm. 
uh, but uh, several, only a few years after they, the family left that area, ancient Samarkand and several other of the major cities were completely destroyed. So he and his family went 2,000 miles westwards and uh, arrived in Anatolia in the late teens, early 20s of uh, the 13th century. And there he remained. Um, he, went to, he went to study at madrasas in Aleppo. And um, in, um, uh, it's said that he um, listened to Ibn Arabi lecture in Damascus. Um, a lot of it, a lot of the information we have about Rumi is uh, what we might call hagiographical. But the, uh, uh, so some people uh, have um, argued that um, he taught the doctrine of Ibn Arabi, that, um, and I'm not going to dispute that be because they are teaching from similar um, traditions, uh, whether their doctrine is exactly the same, I, I, I somewhat doubt myself, but um, uh, he, he, the, um, the man himself um, moved, so to speak, inwards during his life. Um, he began as, um, uh, as a, a, a teacher who was very famous and um, in having inherited his father's role as head of a madrasa, uh, but as he aged and having met, of course, the famous teacher Shamsuddin of Tabriz, after which his divan is named um, in dedication to him, um, he seems to have matured and become this uniquely profound teacher. Um, and that is what is, I think is attractive to uh, Westerners, mm. is that his poetry is both very beautiful, but it's also got an incredible depth to it that is rare, very rare. Absolutely. Well, I think a good moment to, I'd love to have um, a, a little bit of the Mass Navi, maybe the opening and um, um, then hopefully a Qazal as well, one of the lyrical songs. And um, I'm so grateful that you've sent me some lovely images, which I'll also share. So. I'll, I'm just reaching for my copy. I should. I I know it by heart, but I don't trust myself to <laughs> not to read. I'm just going to do a few lines of the opening of the Nayname. Bishnu im Nay chun shikayat mi konad az judai ha shikayat mi konad az neistan ta mara bobrida and. در نفیرم مرد و زن نالیده اند سینه خواهم شرح شرح از فراغ تا بگویم شرح درد اشتیاق هر کسی که دور ماند از اصل خیش باز جوید روزگار وصل خیش I think enough of me so over to you please So I'll read it from my translation, yes. Yes, please. Listen to this read as it is grieving. It tells the story of our separations. Since I was severed from the bed of reeds, in my cry men and women have lamented. I need the breast that's torn to shreds by parting to give expression to the pain of heartache. Whoever finds himself left far from home looks forward to the day of his reunion. I was in grief in all society. I joined with those of sad and happy state. Each one assumed he was my bosom friend, but none sought out my secrets from within me. My secret is not far from my lament, but eye and ear have no illumination. There's no concealment of the soul and body, yet no one has the power to see the soul the reed flute sound is fire, not human breath. Whoever does not have this fire, be gone. It is the fire of love that's in the reed, the turbulence of love that's in the wine. And I think by the time I got to that, I was already hooked. And I know why thinking about it this morning, because I was, 
I knew you were going to ask me to read this passage. Um, that phrase, Atishe Eshk, it's something that it, uh, crops up very uh, frequently in mystical writers such as St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa of Avila, Meister Eckhart, and all the, 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 the great mystics of the European tradition who have, so to speak, gone all the way um, to, to union. And here we have it, and it's a strange image for a Muslim to use because fire um, in, in Islam uh, is more usually used as a symbol of punishment. And is, of course, this is not true of the Sufis, but Oteshe Eshk, the fire of love, is using this old Iranian word, Otesh, um, not Nar, it's, uh, but the old Persian word, and using it in this very positive, but this deeply mystical sense of that which is a, a spark in the human soul, and which um, lights up the human soul, but which may be doused by the the, by life in the flesh, um, but which may just survive and may be kindled by love. And so, you know, that's why I stopped at that line, because he says, he point, he's pointing out that the, the love that's in the reed, the fire that's in the reed, the love that's in the wine, this is a mystical love. And the rest of the Masnavi, you could say, is a meditation on this power, the power of this love in the human spirit. Amazing, amazing. I'm, uh, have you been to his mausoleum? As we speak, I'll try to share this. Uh, yeah, I was there book. just re recently, yeah. Can you see that? That's a, tr uh, that's a nice oh. picture of uh, Hazrat Mavlana, mm. uh, or um, um, uh, as they call him in, um, in Turkey nowadays. Yes. Yeah. Yes, the traditional image. We don't really know what he looked like, of no. course, no. but th there is a traditional image of him, and this, this still to this day is reproduced. There we have a picture of <laughs> the um, mausoleum. It's it's a it's called a museum now, Muzesi, mm. in Turkey be, since the uh, secularization of Turkey mm. by Atatürk. Um, but you see the the uh, beyond the on the left hand side, you see the the of that black and white photograph you see the yeah, the, the mausoleum and that green dome that turquoise yes. dome um uh, is um still standing and yes it is uh, believed to be one of the um yeah, oh, it's for Sufis and for Mevlevis, it's the most sacred, uh, one of the most oh, sacred sites. And it's changed rather a lot, I think, from that black and white picture. I mean, now I understand it has its international airport and it's quite a metropolis, uh, Bonnier, Bonnier, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. It and, certainly does have, uh, yeah. this is the entrance uh, to a very beautiful uh, mosaic. It's, when I was there two, uh, 18 months ago, unfortunately, it was under renovation. Of course, now, at this moment, it's under lockdown, so it's completely closed. But when I went to, I was, uh, I was fortunately able to see the, the tomb. I had first gone there um, in 1973, which happened to be the 700th anniversary of his death. Mm -hmm. That was when I was a mere 20 years old. And... And then um, some 40 years later, uh, I went again in 2007 um, to, uh, which was the, happened to be the 800th anniversary of his birth. Yes. So uh, those were two very auspicious times to visit. And I recently went back uh, to, on a, for a particular purpose, which was to get photographs of the, Konya manuscript, um, original photographs, that is photographs of the manuscript as it is unrestored, yes. so that I could put these photographs into my um, my new book, which... Um, That's right, well here I can um, come to, yeah. oh yes, but that... That, that is the divan, the, yes. that picture. That's, that's the, the divan that is on display in the, mm -hmm. in the Konya Museum. Um, oh, cool. but the, the pictures that you have of the frontispiece of the Nenomed, that's, yes. those are the pictures that I obtained 
from the director who kindly took the assistant director who took the photograph. They're, they're beautiful. They're just the illumination and the, you know... They are still under, they're in remarkable condition in spite of the fact that they are, I have to say, sorely in need of uh, some high-tech preservation. Um, the, the atmosphere in Konya is heavily polluted. Those are images that I've used on the cover of my books yes. from the British Library. Yes, um, well, volume from a Safavid manuscript mm -hmm. um, of 1532. Oh, yes, yeah. I know that uh, um, you know, you know, you've devoted so much of your time and scholarship to the translation of Masnavi, and I have to add that it's not just a pure translation, which is a, which is a Herculean task. I know you also work a lot on. Uh, you know, theory and practice of translation, and it's really a, quite an acclaimed. I mean, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a, 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 a conscious decision to translate this yeah, poetry but, into yeah. blank verse because I didn't yeah. want to lose lose the rhythm of the poetry. Absolutely. Uh, although I've translated it into iambic pentameter, yeah. not not yeah. into Masnavi meter, Ramal meter, yeah. but yeah. I thought it necessary to keep. The, the musicality of the original there yes. to some extent, as far as I could. Of course, and um, but your work of translation, I know you, as you mentioned earlier with Shafi Katkani, you've translated modern poetry as well. And um, it's, uh, uh, you've also done some of the Qazals. And uh, I also note now that I omitted another institution where a lot of your work, both as a, the faculty administrator, professor, you know, teaching was of is, uh, is so perhaps you said you've just retired from Manchester. University, Manchester, yes. How long uh, were you? I'm at? still working for them in a, a, a very reduced capacity as a yes. research professor, but um, yeah, I've I, I've been there I'm very happy at the University of Manchester for many years, 30, yes. 35 years, but. Um, uh, it made it had the fortunate effect on me of having to teach many many subjects, not just Iranian studies, not just Pahlavi or a Western language, and it broadened. Well, Sussex started by beating it out of me uh, this, this sort of ivory towerness that we tend to um, take to as uh, academics sometimes, especially text scholars who are wrapped up in their in their texts. Mm -hmm. So I was. Uh, teaching large classes of students of, of comparative literature, comparative religion. Yes. And uh, yeah, um, I can see why um, this poetry uh, is, is extremely communicative. It's, um, uh, you wanted to read um, Arizal, didn't you? Yes, absolutely, because I was just saying that you have, and I have uh, such fond memories of when we were at the whole festival of um, contains a strong language, I think. And I know that this Qazal, which is one of my favorites, I love it. It wants me, it you know, makes me want to get up and dance. And I thought perhaps we could finish off on uh, reading I'll do the Persian and your wonderful English translation. Um, so, okay, would you be happy if we do this Ghazal? I think, am I right? Ghazal is it number 37 uh, yes. for that. Okay, Alan, Professor Alan Williams, it's been such a pleasure as always to chat to you. I can never have enough. And um, I'll do the Persian and yes. I'll leave you to, I think perhaps we could even come out of this. Okay. <clears throat> یار مرا قار مرا عشق جگر خار مرا یار تو ای قار تو ای خاج نگهدار مرا نوح تو ای روح تو ای فاتح و مفتوح تو ای سینه مشروح تو ای بردر اسرار مرا نور تو ای سور تو ای دولت منصور تو ای مرغ کوه تور تو ای خسته به منوار مرا قطره تو ای بحر تو ای لطف تو ای قهر تو ای قند تو ای زهر تو ای بیش میازار مرا حجره خورشید 
توی خانه ناهید توی روزی امید توی راه به یار مرا روز توی روز توی روز توی حاصل در یوز توی آب توی کوز توی آب ده این بار مرا دانه توی دام توی باده توی جام توی پخته توی خام توی خام به مگزار مرا این تن اگر کم تندی راه دلم کم زندی راه شدی تا نبودی این همه گفتار مرا Beautiful, you read the whole thing. <laughs> I'm just going to read four baits okay. of that because of course it, the, the wonderful thing about what you've read is that it, it's so rhythmic and so lilting. The rhythm is wonderful. I can't do justice to it in translation. My friend, my refuge, and my heart-consuming love. You are my friend, my refuge, and my master guardian. You are the knower, you are the spirit, you are the opener, you are the opened. You are the breast that's laid bare, you're at the door of my secrets. You are the seed, you are the snare, you are the wine, you are the cup. You are the cooked, you are the raw. Don't leave me in the raw state. If this body were diminished, then my heart would not be ambushed. You'd be my path. There would not be all of these words. Wonderful, Alan. Wonderful, Alan. Thank you so much for giving us your time. You've made the lockdown a lot more bearable. Thank you. Happy to talk to you.